not all the end of the last class, so just you know, this is what the board looked like at the end of, of the previous class over there. Um, so if you recall, we were looking at uh, drying this filter cake that's been, um, most, it's mostly dry after it comes out of this filter press. Um, but there is some residual moisture in those pores, in, the, in that packed solid over there that to dry out. So it's 30% moisture retained on the wet basis. And we're aiming to dry it to 10% dry basis. So I'm essentially chosen these two bases in the example to illustrate what I mean by wet and dry basis. And this is where we end up last class. So wet basis is, is fairly easy to use. If we say we've got 100 kilograms of solids, and it's got 30% moisture on the wet basis, it simply implies that there's 30% of that total mass of wet solid is moisture. So 30 kilograms water, 70 kilograms solid. The dry basis um, implies that here, and so here's a side example unrelated to the problem we're dealing with, just to illustrate that. So on the dry basis then, if we have 200 kilograms of wet solids, 30% moisture on a dry basis, so 30 divided 130, mass of water divided by total mass, essentially, to get you that fraction of water, multiplied by the mass of solids, we have, we can then calculate the, the kilograms of water, and then by difference, the kilograms of, of dry solids, and you can just prove to yourself that the ratio of those gets you that point three. Okay, so uh, when we're saying on a dry basis, in our numerator here, we've got the kilograms of water, divided by the kilograms of dry solid. That's why it's called a dry basis. So total water divided by total mass of dry solids. That's the key difference. Now, the reason why we use the dry basis is that it's the easiest one to measure. We simply take our solid, shove it into the oven, weigh it before, weigh it afterwards. The difference tells us the kilograms of water. The mass afterwards of the solid is dry, tells us the mass of the dry solids, obviously the ratio of the two gets you a dry basis. So dry basis is most commonly used, uh, but you will sometimes see wet basis. So we ended off last class then with a small mistake that uh, Janet pointed out to me at the end. 30 kilograms of moisture is what we started off with. We want 10% moisture on the dry basis. So following this idea that we say dry basis is equal to kilograms of water divided by kilograms of solid, well, what's going to be left in our solid afterwards is 70 kilograms of dry solid that we're going to be left with afterwards. But in our numerator, we're going to have 30 kilograms of water minus what we pour off. So that's equal to 10%. If you've been calculating what delta M subscript water is, it's 23 kilograms of water that we need to dry with. So last class I had a small mistake there at 29.7. Uh, please correct, uh, correct that. So it's 23 kilograms of water that we're aiming to add. And we're going to do that by supplying our airstream at 75 degrees with a rate of 10% relative humidity. That's what we're going to use. And it's really provided at a velocity of 4 meters per second relative to the solids. And how we're going to apply that velocity stream parallel to the solids. So let's go back to our calculations then. Um, uh, let's break this question down into sub subsections. The first quick part is to then estimate the humidity of that incoming air stream. So 0 0.04 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air is what I obtained when I look at my psychometric chart at 75 degrees C, 10% humidity. Uh, so we've got our incoming moisture here, 75, come up to 10. 10% moisture read across, and my formula is correct here. So there's 10% moisture read across 0 0.04 kilograms of water per kilogram dry air. So that's my incoming incoming air streams humidity. What is the wet bulb temperature of that air stream? I estimated 41 and a bit. Um, again, you follow those diagonal lines which we looked at the derivation yesterday. So 75 degrees go up to 10% humidity and then come diagonally across round about to that point. I, I landed up over there with my point it is, so it's between 40 and 42 and a half, so I just made it 41.25 to 41.3. That's how I up. So that's my wet bulb temperature. 
And the reason why I need that is because in this equation, the, to estimate the drying time, I need both my dry bulb and my wet bulb temperature. My dry bulb temperature, I know that's 75 degrees, but my wet bulb temperature, 41.3. I know the surface area of the material I'm drying, it was two meters squared that was given to me. The only other two pieces of information I need is the heat of vaporization and the heat transfer coefficient. So let's take a look at those remaining two pieces of information. To get the heat transfer coefficient H, I need to know G. Uh, so the formula for H is a function of 0 0.204 times G raised to 0 0.08. But G itself is a function of the density and the velocity. So the velocity I'm given, the density I don't know. Density I can calculate by saying that's the inverse of the human volume. And the inverse, that human volume is a function of the of psi, the humidity, and a function of the temperature. So let's take a look then at, at estimating the human volume. Uh, so if we go back a few slides, the human volume is given by this formula over here. So it's the volume of air based on the dry bulb temperature. So if you want to just update this slide, I just add the subscript dB there to emphasize that the temperature we use in the humid volume formula is the dry bulb temperature. Okay, so we've got two temperatures we're dealing with, wet bulb temperature and the dry bulb temperature. Dry bulb temperature is the temperature that you measure in the bulk of the air, air itself. So that's just the standard temperature as you measure in an air stream. The wet bulb temperature is the temperature that's right there at that liquid vapor interface on the surface of the solid. So the estimate then of the density of the moist air makes sense to use the dry bulb temperature there. That's the temperature that we're most relevant to. So substituting the dry bulb temperature, 75 degrees C in this case. Um, however, convert it to Kelvin first this, for, for this formula. Convert it to Kelvin. Substitute it in there. Use the humidity we've, we've uh, estimated to then get your human volume. Okay, so once we get our human volume, uh, you can get that value is about 1.048. Sub that into this formula for G, uh, sorry, for uh, inverters, then to get the, uh, an estimate of the density. So human volume, units of meters cubed per kilogram, the inverse of that gets you the density of the airstream. Sub that into the formula for G, and you get 13,740 kilograms per hour per meter squared. So, no, so it's not an SI. <coughs> um, and the reason for that is because this correlation for the heat transfer coefficient requires G to be in those units. When we sub that into that formula, H41.7 joules per second per meter squared Kelvin. So we're almost ready to estimate the time. The final piece of information we need is the heat of vaporization. And the key here is that that heat of vaporization is calculated at the wet bulb temperature. Okay, so the heat of vaporization is the latent heat, uh, sorry, yeah, it's the latent heat to convert liquid to vapor, and that's happening at that at that liquid vapor interface, which is the wet bulb temperature. So we use the wet bulb temperature then that we've estimated up here, 41.3 degrees. And heat of vaporization is a function of temperature. So here's, here it is at two key values at atmospheric pressure, 0 degrees C and 1 degrees C. So just do a linear interpolation between those two points to get a delta H value at 41 degrees, which is where we need it. So if you do that quick interpolation, 2,400. Finally, we're ready then to go ahead and estimate our drying time at 5.5 hours. Five and a half hours to drive, to drive off that amount of water off 100 kilograms of solid. Clearly, if we go and break up that solid into smaller pieces and increase the surface area, we'll decrease our drying time. So that makes sense to us intuitively, and uh, we can see that over there in the denominator. Also, we could look at applying our air stream at four meters per second, but instead of applying it parallel, as is shown here in this uh, illustration, our velocity of our air is parallel to the solids we're driving. We could redesign that unit so that the velocity impinges on the solid perpendicularly. And then this formula here for the heat transfer coefficient would be used instead. Okay, 
So read carefully to understand how that velocity is impacting on the solid. Any questions on that example? So I thought then just to take this section on drying by just uh, taking a look at some of the other equipment that's available for, for drying. We are not going to cover this in any depth in the course. And, uh, the main reason is because there's about six different types of drying equipment and they have relative advantages and disadvantages depending on the area you're working in. So in practice what you do is you go to these drying manufacturers and they will give you a ton of literature out there on their websites and in person to show you the relative advantages and disadvantages for the type of solid you're aiming to dry. Um, I'll talk a bit about that as we go through some of the examples. So, just understand that the aim here is not to cover exhaustively what these uh, dryers look like and how they operate. But in general, they operate in two modes, batch and continuous, a batch being typically for low volume production, one other way we can look at, at considering our dryers is how the heat is provided. We're providing it directly through a hot air stream. Um, so there's convection taking place there, and it's an adiabatic operation. So the heat of vaporization is being provided by the, by the air stream itself and it's sweeping away that moisture. So it's a total adiabatic operation. Some operations are non adiabatic, we provide radiation there to the, to the system, or we, um, we use microwaves or or different frequency wavelengths of, of electromagnetic wavelengths to excite the, the molecule. So one of the my principles of the microwave you're familiar with from physics classes where it's exciting the dipoles on the water molecule and uh, creating heat right inside the surface, inside the solid. And that's useful for drying um, material where we don't want to apply that direct heat. So flammable and explosive materials um, are typically dried this way. And then some dryers, the material is totally stationary. Other dryers, we fluidize or we agitate the solids in some way. And I'll talk about some of that in a minute. Um, so as I said, you choose your dryer based on several, several criteria. One is literally how your wet solids are presented to you. So if they're presented in a solid form or a slurry or a paste or a flowing powder or a filter cake or it's fibers mixed up in a slurry, all of those, one dryer type might be more preferable than another. The choice of heating would also affect which one of the six dryers you pick down here. Um, and then also, as I said earlier, whether we agitate the dryer, uh, agitate the solids or not. So certain material we don't want to get agitated or, or move around too much because they will create fines and, and cause a dust hazard. Uh, so that's typical actually in, in some of the pharmaceutical products. We've got a lot of fine dust powder, powdery material. The last thing you want to do is, is to start agitating that up. Um, so, however, agitation does provide good mixing and, and even heat distribution. So there's an advantage to agitation, but there could be a disadvantage as well. So let's just take a look at some of the illustrations of these so you can understand. Uh, we've already seen the tray dryer, so I want to go through that one again. Um, here's a tunnel dryer which operates on a continuous basis. The solids are loaded up in what are called trucks. They're just uh, like one meter squared, one meter cube type units with the solids loaded in. Um, and these can be loaded in manually or, um, or in an automated system. And they move through this, through this system while the, the air is blowing over it in a counter current manner. The other way we can look at it is presenting our solids here in a feeder and on a conveyor belt which has some sort of mesh-like opening to allow the air to pass through. Uh, we, we blow hot air that's heated uh, internally. Uh, so these little circles would be tubes and we're passing hot steam through those tubes, condensing the steam on the inside of the tube, letting that heat from condensation then be taken up by the airstream. Uh, so we keep our airstream hot and blowing up through those solids. Those solids are then conveyed along the conveyor belt and by the end of the time uh, they, they emerge drier than they stop at all. So we can control the residence time in that unit to get the desired amount of dryness at the end. The next type is a rotating dryer. So here we are agitating the solids, um, though fairly mildly. 
This uh, dryer on the interior has these little lips that pull up the solid and uh, keep it suspended. So there's usually about a 18 to 25 degree angle over there to keep the solids slowly moving over each other. This entire unit itself is inclined by about a, a few centimeters per meter, so maybe two or three centimeters per every meter. There's a slight slope to this unit. And so that allows the material to have a certain residence time remain depending on the slope and the speed at which you're rotating this. Um, you, can, you can vary the time that the solid is exposed to that part of the street. So typical uh, water evaporation rates are between 5 and 50 kilograms of water evaporated per hour per meter cubed of the dryer itself, not per meter cubed of the solids. Uh, so per meter cubed of dryer volume would be typical for this. Uh, another type of dryer uh, works for uh, revolving the drum around and inside the drum again steam is being condensed on the surface, the interior surface of that drum, uh, providing the heat of vaporization to the, to the solid that's then sticking to the drum. So this requires a specific type of slurry which will actually adhere to metal surfaces. So it's usually chrome plated drums that are used and Provided that solid has some ability to stick to the surface, it will then um, stay on there, form a thin layer, and rotate around. And then these knives here uh, will peel off that uh, these solids, which are now should be by that time it reaches that point in a in a powdery form or flakes type form. Um, so here's a dual rotating drum. Those drums are obviously just spaced perfectly apart so that the that, that slurry doesn't fall right through, or a single drum, um, and then some, some of them have a little splash, a splasher on it to provide <coughs> extra feed onto the, onto the edge of the drum. So we're splashing our, our, our slurry onto the drum. There's a spread of it, even it out, and then again the knife right there at the end of the, at the, end of the rotation. Then uh, spray dryers, these are, these are interesting devices. Uh, they have a number of advantages. Uh, they create very small droplets uh, are sprayed out. So here's our feed, our slurry being pumped up and then sprayed out through that nozzle. Obviously, the key design here, the key engineering is around how that nozzle looks. So um, I've, I've seen a number of interesting studies where very, very small changes in that nozzle can create interesting solid shapes and interesting um, or, or faster and slower drying times. So the success of the spray dryer is, is very much dependent on the heat distribution, obviously, but then also the engineering around that nozzle, uh, around those atomizing heads to spray out your solids. So a lot of interesting patents, a lot of interesting companies specialize in just on that uh, uh, nozzle itself. So it will create very small particles, spherically shaped and very uniformly shaped in size. So this is a good advantage if you're trying to present your final product in pelletized form, such as milk powder, fertilizer, detergents, uh, which require very, uh, very narrow particle size distribution. And then the final one, um, which I hope we had a bit more time to cover, um, because it brings in so many parts of this course that uh, we've looked at. There's uh, cyclones and there's nutrition here, Stokes' laws taking place, um, all these concepts. But you, you understand what's going on here. So essentially, what we're doing is, and, and you've probably done a lab on, on a fluidized bed, I would imagine, where we've got our, our product being fed in here through a screw conveyor coming down and as it's coming down, we're also sending hot air up. So that we're creating a drag on these particles. So it's just Stokes law with the vector turned upside down. So we're suspending our particles in this airstream in the same way that an aircraft wing, we've got a high pressure under the wing and a low pressure above the particle here, suspending that particle in the airstream. That airstream then is taking away the moisture from the particle and drying it out that particle then is getting lighter and lighter as it's drying and uh, provided we've got our fluidizing velocity set just right, we'll send those particles up to the top and we'll use a cyclone to recover them. Coming out of the top of our cyclone then is essentially uh, 
just air. So we set our cyclone's velocity and the opening um, velocity on that on the bottom of the cyclone, the underflow, to be just right to allow the air mainly to pass out and our solids to come out of the underflow. We then pass our air stream then through a scrubber just to make sure we're sending out air into the environment that's free of those particles and exhaust that out to the atmosphere. So it's a small uh, liquid scrubber there. Uh, our solids then coming down. Sometimes we'll also recover solids out through the bottom here that, that are slightly heavier and collect both of those solid streams that are now dried and, and take that out to packaging on the next step. So great. We have a great uh, unit of operation for uniform heat distribution. So we won't form any hot spots. Whereas some of the other dry, uh, dryers where your solids are stationary will tend to form hot spots in certain places because you don't get even air distribution through and over your solids. So there's a distinct advantage of the fluidized bed. The other is that there's no moving parts. Cyclone, no moving parts. The fluidized bed, no moving parts. The only moving piece you have is that air blow over there, which is uh, easy to engineer these days to be reliable. So a really good comprehensive unit operation that, that you'll commonly see for drying um, when you can agitate your solids and when uh, you can deal with small particle sizes, it's a good one to use. Okay, so that wraps up drying then. Um, any, any questions on this topic before I just move into the wrap-up of the course? Okay, so if not, uh, please feel free to email me or drop by my office if uh, you have any clarification.